Richard Revolting, covering a civil action. Enjoy the episode. All right. Hey, Jeff. Hey. What if an action? Objection, Your Honor. Objection. <laughs> you always object. Uh, objection. So, Stuart. I object. All I right. object to your objection. It's enough of my objection bit. No. No, sir. This man is deliberately trying to derail my prosecution. You're out of line. Objection. Objection. Objection to his objection to my out of line. The, you're phrasing your questions wrongly. You're leading the witness. You're improperly impeaching. You are taking part in a civil action. The name of this movie. The name of this movie. A civil action. A civil action. Welcome back, folks, to this hey. week's Hey. Um, After we just got done talking yeah, about the thank, long, miserable, <laughs> thanks for thanks for uh, thin red line. Thank you, folks, for listening to last week. Uh, the thin red line. Uh, we're back this week with um, a movie that, in its conception, I would kind of consider the peak of Travolta's career. Explain. So, we've covered his career to a fault up to this point. His like meteoric rise. Catastrophic fall, like kind of lingering, like whatever the fuck the eighties was, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and then rise back to a list stardom, um, and kind of just like the a list era that we're in right now. Yeah, and I think this movie in its conception, you know, because he he's you know came back with indies like Pulp Fiction and whatnot, kind of rebuilt himself in get, get shorty get as get an action shorty. star with. Um, uh, Broken Arrow and Face Off. And she's so lovely. She's and... so lovely. Like, he's just, like, it's been an A list era where he's been rebuilding himself. This movie, um, like many 90s movies, it's just like, it's a legal thriller. There were a lot of legal thrillers in the 90s, a lot of Grisham, a lot of um, movies like this. Yeah. The thing they, most of them have in common is they're all like, they're all star vehicles. Like, the reason you see a movie is because. Matt Damon is playing a lawyer in this movie. He is the selling point of the movie. It's a legal thriller with Matt, Matt Damon. Damon. Matt Damon. The Rainmaker. Oh, um, that's okay. Just a random example. Gotcha. Copy that. But like the legal thriller anchored by a big star was a 90s staple. Yeah. And this is Travolta's go with the bat. He's with... William uh, H. Macy. Well, there's plenty of other actors in this movie. Yeah. But I mean like the poster is just his face, his name, a civil action. Yeah. And the fact that he's at a place where he's anchoring this legal thriller, marketed solely off of his presence in it, Mm -hmm. and the tagline, Justice Has Its Price, um, directed by a relatively, like, respected member of Hollywood, Steve Zayon. Much more known for being a writer. Yes, than than a director. director. Because he did this in 98, and then the... Next film he did was All the King's Men. Yes, he did not do a movie again for like eight years. Yeah. But he wrote movies uh, like Schindler's List, very The Irishman. Prolific very prolific writer. screenwriter. Yeah. But just at this movie is, to me, the peak of where Travolta's at. Tangent. Yes. To go back to Steve Zalian. Um, what's your take on very well-known, popular, famous writers becoming directors? I.e. Aaron Sorkin. Aaron Sorkin. Or, or Charlie Kaufman. Charlie Kaufman. What's your take? Because I have a take. So it really all depends. I mean, we'll get back to Civil Action Mode. But some writers find their niche as as directors. Yeah. Um, and some uh, writers don't. I think, you know, with here's my thing. is I compared this movie a lot to Spotlight. Interesting. Because Spotlight is a movie directed by Tom McCarthy. Very interesting. Tom McCarthy was a writer who and who, an act. but who was already who was already a confirmed director with the King's Speech before Spotlight, which was uh, the best no, picture. No, that, that's uh, Tom Hooper. Tom, Tom Hooper, Hooper did, did the King's Speech. No, right? uh, King's Speech was Tom McCarthy. Or Spotlight I, was Tom McCarthy. Am or, I getting the two mixed up? Tom Hooper did Cats. And then Spotlight? No, Tom, Spotlight Tom Hooper the- did The King's Speech, Les Mis, Danish Girl, and then Cats. Tom McCarthy. Oh, 
Okay, I am sorry, folks. I am <laughs> totally wrong then. I thought Tom McCarthy was the King's Speech. Wow, no, you're... Wow. Okay, okay. I stand corrected. So Tom McCarthy got started as... Um, uh, Fuck, I'm really ashamed of By that. directing the film The Station Agent with Peter Dinklage, which was a big success. Um, and he directed some other movies that, like, some of them don't exist, some of them do. His big, like, moment was he got nominated for Best Screenplay for Up, the Pixar film. Okay, yeah. And he kind of, like, almost segued into kind of just into a writer section of his career, and he became script doctor in a semi-major sense. Yeah. But then he comes back and directs Spotlight. He also directed The Cobbler with Adam Sandler, which the less said about the better. Um, but he was a writer, and more, of a, more known for being a writer than a director. And the movies he had directed are mostly known as being good, not if not like great. And then he comes out with Spotlight, which is one of the most well directed movies I've ever seen. It's so rewatchable. It is an insanely good movie. And then you know what he does right after Spotlight? Christopher Robin. He writes Christopher Robin. He writes he helps write The Nutcracker in the Four Realms. Uh should he could have used another realm. <laughs> IMO. <laughs> Um, and then he directs Timmy Failure, Mistakes Are Made on Disney+. Plus. And then he directed that movie Stillwater that just came out. I haven't that heard has it. A, that's good. Um, it has a lot of criticism for kind of misplaying the Amanda Knox story. Oh, uh, okay. But it's just a very strange career where he went from directing an indie darling, becoming kind of a, a semi-peripheral screenwriter, and then coming back and directing a masterpiece and then kind of just going back to what he was before. Like the stars just align for spotlight to be a perfect movie, a perfectly directed movie. So to go back to my original question though, yeah. Writers who then become directors. Mm -hmm. But I, that was a long way for me to get to that. I compared this movie a lot to that. Where That's like interesting. Steve Zayon is a writer and I think this movie is very well directed. The thing is, from what I've, I haven't seen many of, I haven't seen any of Steve Zahn's other movies, which he only has two, Searching for Bobby Fischer and All the King's Men. I don't know how well directed those are. But it just, it's just very interesting to me that this is a very well directed movie from a guy who didn't really do much else in terms of directing. So I'm going to go on my tangent. Yes. Aaron Sorkin. Aaron Sorkin, the other end of the spectrum. Right. Very good writer. Uh, a social network. Girl with Dragon Tattoo, mm -hmm. brilliant movies. You know and why? Steve Zahn. David Fincher knows what to do with an Aaron Sorkin script. Yeah. And but Steve Zahn co-wrote Moneyball and Girl with the Dragon Tattoo with Sorkin. Actually, I think, um, yeah, Sorkin did not write Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. That was just Steve Zahn. Okay. Um, so then just a social network then. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite movies, only because it's the best combination of like an Aaron Sorkin script, but yeah. a David Fincher movie. Meaning, like, because David Fincher to me is it, he's very much like a camera like director. Yeah. He, I mean, and, and his performances are fantastic as well. The mm -hmm. performances he gets of his actors are amazing. But what he decides to do with the camera is very specific to his own style. Yeah. Um, and the way that he utilizes that to keep momentum in a scene that could yeah. easily become dry. Key example, like a lot of Sorkin's first scenes are, um, exposition vomits. Yes. So a key example, I watched the trial of Chicago seven and I also watched Molly's game, mm -hmm. uh, scripts and films that were written and directed by Aaron mm -hmm. Sorkin. And those, watch the first scene of those movies, folks. They are all just like rapid fire, five minute um, exposition vomit of just like, yeah, this is Molly. He runs a gambling ring and blah, blah, blah. And then she does all this stuff and blah, 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 blah. blah. And we got to do this all stuff. And then she's being tried for all this thing and title Molly's game. Yeah. And it's like, what the fuck? Social network. It's the same dialogue type like Aaron Sorkin where you get Mark Zuckerberg and his girlfriend uh, Rudy Mara at a bar 
and he's having that like rapid spitfire dialogue. But Fincher is using that predominantly in the characters. For instance, Mark Zuckerberg is like this genius like guy who speaks sometimes doesn't always think about what he's saying. He uses that in the scene. He also uses the tension of the scene of what is being said to his advantage with the cinematography. And I feel like that joint partnership that they have really works very well. But when you just have Aaron Sorkin writing it and directing it, I watched Trial Chicago 7 and I I was almost immediately lost in the first five minutes because of how much of like... Sorkin has problems as a director. Yes. Now, can I talk and about this yes you can uh because i worked on that movie <laughs> you did work on i did work on that movie yeah um and i can say um i did a, there was one day where i was the um the village pa where like my job was just to stand next to aaron sorkin and just let people know where he went <laughs> it's basically yeah. my job yeah because that was a very big production um and in that time i got to just basically watch how he works and Sorkin is very much, like, not preoccupied with the many of the aspects of directing. Like, he's there to make sure his script gets translated. Yes. Like, he's there for script and translation. I see it in his movies. He very much, like, delegates to the DP and whatnot to kind of do what they want to do. Yeah. Um, which is maybe why that movie got nominated for best original or best cinematography. <laughs> I think I think and it not did. best directing. I can't remember. But um he very much delegates to that stuff. Um I don't want to say like too much because yeah. Um but You can say too much. No, I'm not going to say too much. Um but he he delegates a lot to his departments and he just wants to focus on the story being told. Yeah, it seems like a lot of the attention that is paid in his movies are the dialogue. Yes, he he won't, he's there for the dialogue. Right, which is a fault. Yes. It's a bug, not a feature. He's not thinking about, I mean, I'm sure he is, but he's not like as focused on the edit or the, the cinematography or how it's all going to play together. He's focused on just like the central story being told. Yes. And then when he gets to the editing room and he pieces it all together, the movies have some faults. And he doesn't think about, in my opinion how how the audience is going to be feeling while the dialogue is being yes. translated. It's just like people aren't just open vats of information waiting yeah. to suckle everything in. Like, no, we need something in addition to the dialogue being spoken. Like, I think Molly's game, the opening shot is just a steady cam follow yeah. following um, uh, 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 Jessica, Chastain. Jessica Chastain and Idris Elba. And it's that rapid fire. Yeah, it's the it's the hallway e- talk e- that Sorkin does. E- e- um, exposition vomit, and just this like dolly shot, mm-hmm. or, or this uh, steady cam leading shot, and then boom, Molly's game title. Yes, and it's like I need something more than that. That's gonna keep me invested. Like, I mean, all you want all, you're asking what you're asking me to do right now is to just listen. You're not asking me to watch, mm-hmm. and that's different in the social network where you need to watch and listen. I mean, Trial Chicago 7 was originally written as a Steven Spielberg script. Oh, man. Like, or, like, Sorkin wrote it for Spielberg. Yeah. Spielberg had has, like, 20 movies on the back burner. Uh, and he told Sorkin to direct it himself. Mm. Um, and I think... Which I'm kind of glad. With because Spielberg's steady hand, that movie would have been a masterpiece. I don't think so. Ooh, I think it would. Well, no, I'm because I'm I'm, ima- I'm remembering like what Spielberg was doing at the time, and he was kind of making the transition into political dramas, and it just like some of uh, his best movies. I I don't want to get into this with you, Jeff, but a Bridge of Spies is just fine. Bridge of Spies is a it, modern American masterpiece. It's just as fine. is the Post. It's oh. I just like. I am having a hard time listening to you say that the post is so good and not so mentioning ET at all with it. Like you can't, you can say e. the post is great. E. Can, is, a, is an old American masterpiece, and it's better than the post. Yeah. Say the words, Jeff Sweeney. 
on this podcast that we're recording. Say E.T. is better than the post. I want you to hear. I want you to say the fucking words. Post pretty good, though. <laughs> That's what I fucking mean. That is what I mean with you, man. That is what I mean. It's like we all know it, but you're refusing to give that. You're refusing to give that to me. Well, that's because the post is maybe a little better. It is not. Maybe the I'm... post is not better than E.T. The post is not better than Jurassic Park. The I... post is not better than Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh, the I, post I would is not better that. than Jaws. The post is not better than The Last Crusade. The post is not better than AI. What are you, what are you you're on about some craziness right now? So here's the thing. No, there's the post in my little rank in here. You have it above E.T. Yes. You have it above A.I. You have it I above would maybe... Saving Private Ryan. You have it above Catch Me If You Can. Yes. You have it above Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Above The Last Crusade. Above War of the Worlds Minority Report. Munich. I mean, all great movies. I All great movies. You can't. Tell me the, the post, post is, is better. It is. The you, Post and Bridge of Spies are two of his best movies. Why? I want to hear why. Ugh, they're just so well made. You, okay. They're modern more... American masterpieces. About... How, why, what makes them modern American masterpieces? Have you watched the fucking movies? I have, and they're just, they're boring. Ugh, uh, you know what the best moment in the Post is? What's the best moment in the Post? There's the part in the When post. it ends? No, when they're trying to decide whether they're going to publish the reports, the Pentagon oh Papers. Oh, my God. Listen, we went wait, from... Wait, 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 no. Oh, right. We're going to get back to a civil I'm, action. I'm sorry to interrupt. I have a segue back into the civil I'm action. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Continue. Why um, is that the best okay. part of the movie? So it's a beautiful moment of like just when a, everything lines up perfectly. Like the director and the actor are very locked in. Something Sp Because Spielberg does not rehearse is the thing he does not do. He does not rehearse any of his scenes. Not in pre-production, not on set. He blocks it, and then they, they shoot. Um, but there's just this beautiful moment of like everything lining up, where they're trying to decide where to like whether to publish the papers. And it comes down to Meryl Streep making the decision. And Spielberg lines it up with this big push-in shot to her, like, leading to her dramatic declaration they're going to do it. And, like, John Williams is swelling the score at this moment. And you're pushing in. You're getting ready for her to be like, we're going to publish. In this triumphant moment, it gets right up to her. John Williams is swelling. And rather than a triumphant declaration, she, like, murmurs and starts out, like, yeah, let's do it. Let's, let's, do it. let's do it. Let's do it. And it's just this beautiful moment of director-actor synchronity of all this buildup and then undercut by Meryl Streep, like, ugh. This is so good. So good. I can name 20 better scenes in all of his better movies. A great movie. Than that. Uh, Post this movie. Alan, Gr Alan Grant seeing a dinosaur for the first time. Good scene. Not as good as the post scene. E.T. and Elliot making the satellite communication thing and him cutting his finger and healing his finger. See, you're you're all about the Spielberg Sandwich. wonder. Raiders of the Lost Ark, the sword fighting scene when Indy pulls out his gun and just shoots the guy. A great scene. Beautiful bits of character. AI at the end when he is unfrozen from the block of ice and the silicone beams. Okay, how long have we been talking about Steven Spielberg? Give him a memory of his mom. Like, Jeff, I love you to death, but I can't sit You know, sit cut this here. fucking... We're going to watch the post right now. <laughs> I will pull it off my shelf. <laughs> He's actually doing it. <laughs> oh, Christ. I have put the Blu-ray of the post in the middle of our table. I, You're my best friend. I appreciate it. And I love you to death. I hope you know, like, you know, we can have these conversations, these arguments, and we'll move on from them. It's yeah. totally fine. But you are wrong. You e are extraordinary wrong. Extraordinary. Must see Peter Travers, Rolling Stone. Fantastic. A spectacularly entertaining thriller. Amazing. David Ehrlich, Indie That's Wire. so great. I'm so happy for you. E.T.'s. Hanks and Streep are a match made in movie heaven. Richard Roper, Chicago Sometimes. So great. So great. 
Henry Thomas made Spielberg cry in his audition. But the two must risk their careers and their freedom to bring truth to light in this powerful film with a celebrated cast. The Zolly shot of Chief Brody and Jaws. Ooh, a great shot. The what scene in the boat, when they're not even looking for the shark, they're just singing and talking about all their scars. That is one of the best scenes ever made. I just, I can't, it's hard to do this with you, man. Because, like, I feel like you're going down a path I can't follow. And I, I want to, I, I want, first off, I respect that you like these movies. You are welcome to like these movies. These, these movies are, are my exact kind of movie. I, and I'm happy for you. I'm very happy for you that you found a very particular niche of Spielberg that while may not be great for other people, but for you has really resonated. Spirit. I am so happy for you that you, you have wanna that. You want to hear a really slick, se- slick segue. You know what else is exactly my kind of movie like the post? A civil action. All right. Well, that's your way of telling me to shut the fuck up. <laughs> that's my <laughs> way. we have talked 20 minutes. <laughs> that's Steven Spielberg. <laughs> that's Steven Spielberg. Um, um, you know how we got on this? When we do the Hanks cast, <laughs> we will have plenty of time for this. Okay. Um, a civil action. Yeah, civil action. <sighs> yes. Directed by Steve Zayn. Just why don't you just go into the context corner? Yeah, While the, you talk about the context corner, I'm going to try to like release all that bad negative energy that, that energy. I just <laughs> pent up into me. <laughs> so go into the context corner, and hopefully, I'll be back into this race. Yes. Uh, so this is a Steve Zayn picture. Um, a uh, he had only directed one movie prior to this, Searching for Bobby Fischer, as I said. Um, Searching for Bobby Fischer. You know, it came out. We got nominated for best cinematography. Very good reviews. Um, a moderate success. Uh, didn't really make a lot of money, but like in terms of just purely respectability, a moderate success. Zayon basically queued up for another movie. He's also coming off of written, writing the scripts for Schindler's List, Clear and Present Danger, Mission Impossible. Like he, he has hits under his belt. They're going to let him direct another movie. Yeah. And he chooses a civil action, which is based on a book um, from 1995 under the same name as Civil Action. Uh, which itself is based on a true story of the court case um, against um, Grace and uh, Beatrice Foods. Foods, yeah. I think they changed the names of those companies right? Um, for the movie. Because they couldn't sue Kellogg's. Yeah. Like they couldn't, I don't know like if they it was actually Kellogg. Kellogg's. <laughs> they become a Kellogg or whatever in the movie. Um, but pollution in the town of Woburn, Massachusetts, which they keep the name of Woburn, they keep the name of the citizens in this movie. That's all accurate. Oh, okay, cool. Um, but yeah, it fo- it's about um, that that case, a legal thriller. Um, but even more so, it's very specifically a movie about John Travolta's character, Jan Schlichtman, and uh, kind of the place of justice in our like what the the role of the lawyer is. And what the role of the courtroom is. Yeah, and what is the point of the court? And is it a place to find truth? Is it a place to find truth, or is it a place to find reward? And that is the, the quest that essentially Travolta is going on. The courtroom is a battlefield, but not for always the righteous things. Yes. This is a very meaty role for Travolta, and I think he does a very fine job in this movie. I was very into what he's doing. I'm very into the direction of this movie. The shot, the shot, this camera movement in this movie, like Steve Zayn was on set for Schindler's List or something. He he was learning from the, he was learning from the boss himself. Yeah. Um, that's basically the extent of the context corner. Um, you know, Travolta is still in his high at this point, and they don't really have much to say about his context. Yeah. We've discussed it ad nauseum in the last few episodes. I think I might be slightly like, tainted for this movie, and I'll tell you why. Because I went from Thin Red Line to yeah. this. And these are two very different yes. movies. From even like the surface level, one is very plotty. Yes. This movie has a lot of business in it. Yes. A lot of business, not so much thematic material. Mm. Thin, I, I Thin Red would, Line? I would say opposite. I would say it has a lot of theme going on. In the Civil Action? Yes. There's a lot going on in this movie that I was really vibing with. But not on the surface as what Thin Red Line is. Yes. The Thin Red Line. Like, it doesn't line, have characters monologuing. I mean, it does have characters monologuing over. But it does. Um, it doesn't have, you know, we were, we were there, but were we really there? Yeah. 
I left some of myself behind. And like I had to like kind of shut that. Reckon. Uh, fuck you. Oh, I there's had, Billy Bob Thornton's uh, narration uh, coming stop, out of the woodwork. Stop. Um, uh, be be kind to our audience. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, like I I kind of had to turn that part of my brain off of like expect a plot. Yeah. In the thin red line, and then I went into this movie, and it was like all plot, all plot, all business. And you know, I think I, I, this movie didn't necessarily turn me off, but I was definitely like missing the l- random cutaways to lizards yeah. <laughs> in this movie you know like a lot of the ambiguous not totally clear reasons mm-hmm. this movie has very clear reasons for everything in this movie yeah. um theme or no theme like when it's trying to you know expel out a, th- a message for its theme it's very obvious when it does that not so obvious in the thin red line you have to really work at it yeah um this movie kind of hands everything to you the thin red line is a movie that asks you to think yeah this is a movie that asks you to listen. To observe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you have to participate in the thin red line. Yeah. You, you're just Part- an observer in this movie. Yeah, you're. this movie asks you to listen to what's trying to say. Yeah. Whereas the thin red line like invites you to have a dialogue with it. Yes. Agreed. 100%. Um, so I, I shouldn't really say that it, you know, it, it dings this movie because it's yeah. just a different, it's a different ask. But I, I definitely was sent through this movie going like, okay, like where's yeah. where's the room for interpretation? Where's like the ambiguous moments that I have to figure out for myself? Yeah. Like, you know, I didn't like so much that everything I, I could kind of understand everything that was going on. And I'm like, okay, great, cool. So yeah. he's a lawyer who was all about money. And then he becomes a lawyer who's not all about money. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Mm. Wonderful. Um, he's disillusioned in terms of his views of what the courtroom yeah. once was like, these are all things that are in the movie and it just tells you these things and it's great. Yeah. They're great messages, but it's also like they, you're told those things. Mm-hmm. You're just like, okay, awesome. Cool. You mm-hmm. know, you know, it's like, it's not till the end of Jurassic park when you have to really think for yourself. If you think that the dinosaur creation was a good thing or a bad thing, mm-hmm. like you really kind of have to like, I mean, yes, they spent a whole fucking hour in that movie telling you why the creation of dinosaurs was a bad thing. But it still leaves the room for interpretation because there's like, there's like you know the beautiful moment in the helicopter when they're flying away, and you just see like the birds flying too, yeah. and it's like this this moment with nature, and it's like you know if we have the opportunity to bring things back, to let it once give it a second chance of life, should we? You know, we were um we did a four p.m. to a four a.m. Uh, shoot like a week or two ago, mm-hmm. and uh, the night before I tried to like reset my clock so I could not die over during that uh shoot yeah uh so i just put jurassic park on <laughs> i watched that in the live action lion king at like 1 a.m good for you man uh crazy night um so yeah the fact that this movie just kind of hands you everything yeah to me it, it that kind of bumped me a little particularly from after mm-hmm. the thin red line but i even think even if i didn't watch the thin red line yeah. i still would have been like Okay, like, mm-hmm. I, I get what this movie is saying. Yeah. Not what it's trying to say, what it's saying. See, the, the reason I really vibe with this movie is that it's a kind of movie that would be a miniseries nowadays and all the worse for it. Hmm. Like, we don't get these really tight, sub-two-hour-long, star-driven legal thrillers with just tight plotting, tight direction, um you know, with stacked cast, if this kind of movie made nowadays to be a seven episode miniseries. And you think that's for the worse? I think that's for the worse. Why? Because sometimes you just need two hours to tell a story. And a lot of miniseries nowadays are, I feel like they're dragged out movies. Is there an example that you have? Because I hear what you're saying, yeah. but my mind went immediately to the good ones. Mm, like yes. Chernobyl. If you made Chernobyl to our movie, yeah. we would have missed a lot. If you made the People versus OJ, the American Crime Story, yeah. a two-hour long movie, we would have missed a lot. And I feel like it's less about a specific example and more just that these type of movies don't get made anymore. Like okay. there's maybe the one. The there's maybe they... one every other year. Like there was that um, uh, Mark Ruffalo movie, Dark Water, which is a similar movie to that. It pretty much has the and same. Plot did anybody as watch it? I did. Um, <laughs> but maybe that's it. Goes to your point though, yes. is that these movies. They rarely ever get made, and when they yeah. do, who goes and watch, yeah. watches them anymore? They make them as miniseries nowadays because, like, no one wants to make a forty. People, mi- no one wants to make a forty million dollar. Um, like people watch the miniseries, though. Yeah, I mean, you know, 
Like I hear what you're saying. I really mm-hmm. do. Um, it's just for me, it's like, I don't particularly miss this genre. Yeah. I just, I do. I, and I get why after our last yeah. 20 minute whole rant tangent yeah. thing, I do understand. There's, there's nothing I really enjoy more, um, than, oh my God. No, Stuart. No, do you, stop. Stop. Do you see who's in the kitchen right no, now? No, please don't. Please don't. It's. <laughs> I beg you. Please don't do what you're about it's to do. Someone who's considering <laughs> subletting. It's Sling Blade. <laughs> hey, Sling, come on over here. Mm, I reckon. All right, Sling, come on over. Here. Come on over here. <laughs> Stuart is dying right now. Um. So, so Sling, um, what were you looking for in the kitchen? Are you, you still considered so? I reckon I get me some of them potatoes, French fried. Uh, you, you want some? What do you want with them? Or get some mustard on them? All right, the mustard's in the fridge. Uh, go get some. Stuart is walking out of the room. Uh, Sling, have a good night. All right, I reckon. Uh, he's Stuart has literally left the building. Um. But yeah, I'm still here. Uh, so we're going to talk about a civil action now. Bye, Sling. Uh, uh, the things I do. You guys really egged me into that one. It was also ill-prepared. I didn't have any uh, material. I just want you to know, every time you're going to do that from now on, I'm just going to walk out. <laughs> I'm just going <laughs> to fucking leave. I'm just going to leave to let you do this bit <laughs> to let you be by yourself with your thoughts with your microphone and your headphones so you can yeah. do this i'm just worried. i was really prepared to just talk about the civil action by myself for <laughs> 20 minutes <laughs> i was ready okay so okay. A civil action yeah civil action um i was basically saying before sling blade visited uh, <laughs> uh french rub potatoes um before he visited, um, that I just miss, like, there's a lot of 90s genres that I miss. It's this and kind of, like, the the tight action movies from that era. Mm-hmm. Like, your 90-minute action movies, your two-hour, your, like, sub-two-hour legal thrillers, just, like, the programmers of that era. The things that the studios made because they needed something to come out in, like, April or mm-hmm. come out in September. Yeah. Um, and so, and sometimes they would just be too good to be ignored. And so I'm soft on movies like this. Um, I don't want to say I'm soft because I do actually genuinely like this movie. But it's just something that I very much enjoy, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think that's totally and, understandable. And I think that this, this movie has some very smart decisions being made. And in the current like film climate, you don't see movies that have the opportunity to really do this. Like movies are either made for cheap now or they're made for expensive. You don't see someone given a good budget, not a great budget, a good budget to make a good movie. Yeah. I mean, which we talked about a lot with like yeah, we, some of some of our movies. Yeah. With our, with our, the disappearance of our mid studio yeah. level movies. I mean, I, I don't disagree with any of that. Mm. Um, I think that if you have a particular connection to these types of movies, then who am I or anybody yeah. to, you know, discount the, the, the certain absence of those yes. movies? I exist. I do agree with that. Um, I mean, I, I my guttural reaction is to then say movies like Spotlight kind of replace those. Yes. And it all for the better. Um, I actually want to check really quickly what the budget for Spotlight is. Yeah. Budget Spotlight has a twenty million dollar budget. That is exactly the type of movie I want to see more of. Yeah, this movie. Now, this movie had a way too big budget, which is something that we'll talk about. That kind of hurts it when it comes out. This movie cost seventy five million dollars. That's it. Cost what? more than the Thin Red Line. What? How? This cost twenty million dollars more than the Thin Red Line. How? Probably just because they had to pay John Travolta an insane amount of money. Jesus. And probably Christ. Duvall a lot of money. But yes. And this is part of, in this, in addition to what I said, this is kind of like to me the peak of Travolta's star power. The peak also means there's a cliff on the other side. Yeah, um, that we get to in two weeks. Oh, it's uh, that soon, isn't it? Yeah, we're very close. Um, Wait, two weeks from this th- episode? 
uh, two weeks from us recording. We'll be covering it in two weeks. And then it comes out. So like, when this episode... It comes out about, I think, three weeks from when this episode comes out. When you that... folks are listening to this in three weeks, it'll be uh, Battlefield time. And uh, not the video game. Yeah. But Travolta's getting a little too close to the sun. He's getting the big paychecks. The movies are a little too big budgets for his star level. And this movie flops because of that. Because it costs too much. And for another movie with this exact same, like, a movie made exactly the same as this with a lesser budget, this would have been a huge hit. And I'm going to even go a step further yep. than that. And I love our boy John Travolta. Yes. But a lot of other actors could have played that role for a lot mm-hmm. less money. Yes. And uh, this is probably going to get even worse hype. Same for Robert Duvall. And here's the thing. I know that's sacrilege because he got a, a, a supporting an actor nomination for this. this movie. Yes. I don't, it's like, I, it's hard for me to see that. Yes. And not think, oh, they just gave it to him because it's about time. Mm-hmm. Because of any movie that he deserved a supporting actor nom for and all the movie, great movies he's done, this is the one they pick? Oh, he's got nominated for a lot of things. Ag- uh, agreed. I'm just saying, like, he got nominated for The Apostle the year before this a movie he directed as well. I just like, and the bits that he's in, he is good. What bits? Rob, what bits is he doing? No, like the small. I was making. A okay, joke yeah, the about small, bits. the small portions of this movie he's in, and yeah. I say small. He's in a good chunk of this movie, but he does disappear. I will say partway, mm-hmm. and then comes back mm-hmm. at the end. But I don't think his utilization warranted a best supporting actor nomination, in my opinion. Here's what I will say in opposition to that. Okay. Is that going off of these movies, nowadays, best supporting actor... Is one good scene. Is, in modern movies that come out, I feel like it's most supporting actor a lot of years. And not... I don't want to say every nominee and every winner. What's going on? No, sorry. I was just adjusting my head. Okay. All right. Um, Continue. Whereas supporting actor in something like this, it, he is a supporting actor. He is there to support the main actor and support the plot. And he does a very strong job at that. And he's giving exactly what this movie needs at exactly the right times. I agree with that. And so, like, Brad Pitt winning Best Supporting Actor for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, while a great performance that I love very much, he's arguably a co-lead. Yeah. I would right. not even say arguable. I'd say he is a co-lead of right. that movie. But he gets he wins Best Supporting Actor. Hmm. And so I feel... And this isn't just something that's... Like, this happened with The Godfather in the 70s. Al Pacino got nominated for Best Supporting Actor for a movie where he is the lead of the movie. Right. Because Brand, they wanted Brando to win Best Actor. And so it's not even a thing, like, that happens just nowadays. It's happened for forever. But I feel like we we've lost what best supporting actor is and it can be a small role or it can be a big role it's less about the size or the most of it all and about the impact they make in it, their in what they have it's mahershala ali in moonlight yes he's only in the first third of that movie but his impact is felt for the whole thing like he's yeah. essential to making that movie work yeah he has he supports the pillars of that movie. you know what i think is a very let me check to make sure it is underrated before I call it underrated. <laughs> um, I think it is though. Um, but William H Macy room. Oh, room. The Brie Larson. Yeah. Um, do you remember him in that movie? Yes. Um, I just want to double check before and I, the movie got a lot of praise. Movie got a lot of praise. He did not get anything for his role in the movie. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm checking it now and I'm confirming. He did not get like, he didn't get an Oscar nom. He didn't get anything. Not even a Golden Globe. Yeah. And he's not in that movie for very long. About less than Mahershala Ali in Moonlight. Mm-hmm. But, oh my God, his impact in that movie. Mm-hmm. So fucking good. Um, Just quick, small tangent, but just like, he doesn't come in until they escape. And... He's like home with Brie Larson and um, what's the serial killer's name? Um, uh, Anthony Hopkins. No, no, no. The little <laughs> kid. The little uh, kid. 
the little kid. Jacob Tremblay. Jacob Tremblay. Jacob Tremblay, the little serial killer, yeah. The main Coke dealer. <laughs> um, he doesn't come into the movie until after they've escaped. Mm-hmm. And he, then he's gone, like, partway through Act 2. But when he walks in that hospital room and he sees his daughter, like, fi- for the first time in, yeah. like, seven, eight, ten years or whatever, and his instant reaction to seeing her yeah. breaks everybody's hearts. Mm-hmm. And you think, oh, my God, like, these are, like, parents reunited with a child. Yeah. Like, how amazing is this going to be? And then you find out that they're separated and that he's an alcoholic. Mm-hmm. And he's also ashamed of Jacob Tremblay, that he's his daughter's rapist son. Yeah. Um, and that the, uh, the daughter's mom got remarried to another guy. And that they're actually now like a broken household. Yeah. And that he's got his own he sells it. personal things to deal with. And that it's not the ideal home that they're coming back to anymore. Mm-hmm. So impactful. So good. So well delivered. And does exactly what yes. the movie needs. One of the best. Supporting performance. Exactly. And I think it from what you just said about Robert Duvall. And yeah. what we just said established with Mahershala Ali and Moonlight. I think that that is one of the most underrated supporting performances yeah. ever. Is William H. Macy yeah. in Room. Yes. And I would sue <laughs> Hollywood. You would, I you would file a civil. I would action. file a civil action, like the name of this <laughs> what, movie what, we're what, talking what, about. What, what number are we at? Forty. <laughs> okay, we have not even talked about the movie. We, um, yeah. Okay, um, which is fine. It's fine. And people don't listen to this podcast to hear us talk. What's about What's your movies. call time tomorrow? Uh, six something. I don't know. Mine's six twelve. Okay, so we're bleeding into my twelve hour turnaround. All right, we're doing it. We're doing it. We're doing it. Um, I'm gonna. I'm bringing up my call sheet for tomorrow. Uh, we still have one more movie to cover today. I know. <laughs> uh, 642. So we're okay. we're both bleeding into our 12-hour yeah. turnaround right now. Okay. Which is fine. Which is fine. I know. It's okay. okay. But um, so this movie starts with a long take of John Travolta pushing a wheelchair down a hallway in a courtroom. Yeah. Um, and he's mo- narrating over Narration it. voiceover. And he's basically just talking about, because he's a... The perfect ideal client for civil lawsuits. Yeah, he's a personal injury lawyer. Yeah. Um, and he's uh, an ambulance chaser. Some call them, yeah, because they're they're in it for the money. They're right. in it for quick settlements where they get a cut. Yeah, um, and he's kind of monologuing about what the best payouts are in this industry. Well, he t- he talks about like what who the perfect um, victim is. Victim is, and yeah. he says like you know white male forty. Well, he who he, has their whole life ahead of them just taken away. Yes, he preempts what his storyline in the movie is going to be. Yeah, because he says like the the perfect crime or the perfect uh, client is a white male mid forties struck down in his prime. Oh man! Yeah. And John oh, Travolta man. is a white male mid forties <laughs> struck down in his prime. Oh, and I all right. Sec- I'm gonna do a fist bump on that one. That, that was really good. That's he says really that. The good. second he says that. I know exactly what this movie's going to be about. Mm-hmm. It's going to be about him going from being the shark to being the prey. Yeah. Because John Spoltz in this movie, he's playing a low-status person. like He's a like an injury lawyer who everyone looks down on, pretending he's high-status, trying to it's achieve like high-status. He's like the number status. one bachelor or whatever. Yeah. Right. He's trying to achieve like a high-status position, mm-hmm. but then learning the value of being low-status and doing the public good. I take back what I said. John Travolta is the perfect role for yes. this fucking movie. Yes, <laughs> exactly. You're picking up what I'm putting down. Yeah, we're you're you're getting you're getting on this movie's wavelength. Okay. All right. <laughs> Minute um, forty three. We'll see. And um, the thing he says at the end of it is that what's the thing that's worth the least is a child. Base like he's saying like the most valuable thing is himself. The least valuable thing is the life of a child. Yeah the end of this movie he's gonna think the most valuable thing is the life of a child the least valuable thing is himself so we establish right in the first line what his mindset is and at the end of this and what we're the reversal of this movie is going to be and this is an this is a great example of what my earlier tangent with aaron sorkin yes is like this is a great solution to that yeah is that you take all that exposition vomit and you get it down to one line Mm -hmm. beautiful yes beautifully done Yes. Uh, and then you get like the opening gag, which I really love because like 
he wheels him into the courtroom and already is taking advantage of his like, yes. decrepit look. He pushes this injured guy into the courtroom. He brings him to the front. He sits down next to him. He looks over at the lawyer representing the um, the bus company, I think, that injured him. Yeah. Guy writes down a little sticky note. He holds up says 1.2 million final. Trolta shakes his head. It's like, no. They start the opening proceedings of the court. Yep. They're like introducing people. The jurors are yeah, looking the, at this Yeah, one of the guy. jurors like starts crying. Yeah. The guy scribbles down. 1.5. Trolta shakes his head. No. He starts like babying the guy, being like, do you need me to grab you anything? Do you need to grab a water? He, yeah. He like, actually like sips yeah. it. He gives him his own water. The lawyer, two mil. Two mil, please. <laughs> Travolta <laughs> nods his head. And then both the lawyers get up and they're like, we've reached a settlement. <laughs> <laughs> and they establish in the movie, the last thing you ever want is to go to trial on something like this. Yeah. And so this is establishing that Travolta is a guy who plays things very close to the chest. And plays it safe. Well, he plays it very close. He gets really close to the line, the thin red line, um, before uh, getting what he wants. He's willing to get, he's willing to ride right to the edge to get the best payout. Yeah. Ostensibly for his clients, but really for himself. Right. And achieve the status that he wants. So that's our opening scene with him. Yeah. And then the next bit, he's celebrating with um, his law team. Uh, Mm -hmm. Played by William H. Macy, uh, Tony Shalhoub, and a guy who I did not recognize. (laughs) Zelkjo Ivanik is a Slovenian actor. Okay. Um, And they're, like, celebrating over, like, black and white, and, like, credits are popping up. Danny Elfman did the score for this. It's kind of... Oh, wow. uh, Really? It's very non-Danny Elfman score. It's like... (laughs) Forgettable, in my opinion. I would agree. But, um... Yeah, they're celebrating. He's going on like radio yeah, things. He and... goes on a radio show. Yeah, where they're like, "Yeah, you're the most, el- you're the third most eligible bachelor and lawyer in this air in the Boston area. It's in the Boston area. Not mm-hmm. enough accents, IMO. Um, <laughs> yeah, what? what no the fuck, one Travolta? comes out. Is like, hey, it's me, John Travolta, <laughs> John F. Kennedy. <laughs> Where's your fucking car keys? You mm-hmm. fucking cocksucker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, um, no one does that. But unfortunately, unfortunately not. But uh, we do see the name James Gandolfini, and we must mark that this is the third James Gandolfini we are now covering on this show. Yeah, he's he's with James Gandolfini a lot. Yeah, this is like the third. That. It was Get Shorty, um, She's So Lovely, and now this. And now this, yeah. he's Him and James Gandolfini have a lot of, a lot Gandolfini. of, a lot of uh, rapport, I guess. Yes. And there's a lot of uh, you know similar co-stars that he's shared the screen with before that are in this movie. Yes. One particularly at the end. At the very end. At the very end. That we'll talk about. We're going to talk well, about. A very wild appearance. <laughs> yeah. Um, but he gets a call when he's live on this radio show. It's a con show. People just ask him questions about his job. And he's trying to advertise himself. Yeah. Um, and a woman calls in an Ann Anderson. Mm-hmm. Good name. Yeah. Uh, she's Good. a real person. Um, really named Ann Anderson. Uh, the case that this movie is based on was named Ann Anderson versus Cryovac Inc. Um, you know, I was taught in screenwriting class that you never make the first initial and last initial the same. Yeah. So, like, you never name someone like Jerome Jackson. Bruce or like Banner. Bruce, yeah, Bruce Banner, Peter Parker. Yeah. Like, all all the names that people often do Stephen in comic Strange. books. It's like, I was taught in, like, screenwriting class, like, don't do that. Yeah. Like, change the initials. Make it, like, Stephen do little yeah, or whatever the fuck. <laughs> <laughs> okay um but he gets a call from ann anderson and he's like and she's like do you recognize me do you know who i am and he's like i don't think i do and she's like well your uh your firm has been handling my case and he's like she's like my son died a lot of kids died in my community in this town woburn massachusetts as a result of chemical dumping and your kid and your firm said they're covering it and we haven't even seen you up here um he's like oh and he's okay. like oh let me write your name down he writes a note that says save, save me, me. <laughs> hands it to the radio announcer yeah we cut to him back in his office and he's mad at his guys for not being on this yeah because he's like we should never have taken this case we're not going to make any money on this right and he talks to william h macy he's like you need to go up and like tell it's like well what usually happens is i try to tell them they start crying i start crying so like okay i'll go do it yeah. myself Charles says he'll do it himself so he he says the line here i appreciate the theatrical value of several dead kids but there's no case here man yeah what a line um um 
and so we cut to him speeding down a highway, uh, down a like, like a side a county road. road. And Danny Elfman's like, bam, 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 and then just cuts off, and he's getting a ticket for a cop. And it's a very funny bit. Yeah. Um, he like really yeah, gets to the and place, then he gets like a, bam, 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 and he gets there. He meets with all the parents, um, and he tells them, "There's no money in this." Yeah, like my firm can't support this, and he's yeah. like, "We need a big target because we need money to sustain our firm." Yeah. And he's pretty much saying, like, we want the clout, and you guys aren't going to give us the clout for this. Right. And the they say, we don't want money, we just want an apology. Yeah. We want to just know who did this and make sure it doesn't happen again. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, whatever. And so he races back. Danny Elfman uh, music. Bam, 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 bam. Pulled over again. <laughs> it's <Yep>. so funny. <laughs> and as he gets pulled over on the same bridge, yes. uh, cop drives away, and then he looks over and sees, like, a little shack yeah. on this river. And he's looking at the river, and he's like, oh, they mentioned that they were dumping in the river. Yeah. And so he just kind of walks along the river, and he gets to the end, and he sees this big tannery factory. Yeah. Um, and there's, like, sludge pouring out of it and all this craziness. And then we get a really slick shot that I like, um, where we essentially, like, we're, we're in, it's a POV of Travolta, and we're following his mindset, and we follow the money. We're like, he's looking at the factory... He's looking at the water. Camera's moving on. Grace manufacturing. We move on to the side of a truck that's just like the local company. And then moves down a little bit, all in the same shot, to subsidiary of Beatrice Food. Mm-hmm. We look, We get back at Travolta. You can almost see the dollar signs in his eyes. Yeah. He realizes there is money in this case because there's now a big company attached to it. Right. So he takes the case. Yeah. Um. So they they take the case and they go straight into like depositions. Yeah, and we get another troll to monologue where he's like, "Lawsuits are war," and and just like war, it starts with the declaration of war. Yeah, and so they send like the the subpoenas or whatever the hell they are out. Yeah, and we get our first taste of Bobby Duvall, Bobby who's just Duvall. hanging out listening to the Red Sox in his little like lair. And his little portable radio. Yeah, his little portable radio. And an intern walks in and tries to hand him like, the deposition. And he's like, you know, I like it when I get... That's not. That's bad. I'm not going to do it. He's like, you know, I like my free time. And the intern's like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And he like, scuttles off. Um, and then one of the other lawyers, Mr. Cheeseman. Yeah, Mr. <laughs> I really like the bit in this movie with that's Mr. A pre- it's a pretty good bit. The chess man or his cheese name, man. His name's Chessman and everyone calls him Mr. Cheese Man. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's how it's spelled. Yeah. It's spelled like and Cheese like, Man. Cheese Man. Even his like friends call him Cheese Man. <laughs> um so he calls Robert Duvall. Yeah. And he's like, Have you ever heard of like a section eleven or whatever it yeah. is? And he's like, What is that? It's like it's basically like you find somebody for frivolous lawsuits. Yeah. Which is something that <laughs> happens today, actually. It's a real yeah. thing. Um that you can like punish somebody for frivolously suing yeah. you. It's supposed to like be anti slap suits. Yeah. Thanks, John Oliver, for that <laughs> lesson. <laughs> Learned about slap suits. Yep. And fuck you, Bob. Fuck you, Bob. Rest um, in peace. But um, something that Travolta mentions is like the most important thing to going in to uh, a law is that you you want a lawyer who has no feelings, no compassion, and no empathy. And also, like you're going to go up against like these big corporate lawyer offices, yeah. and it's important not to get intimidated. Yes, because they will try to intimidate you. Because a big idea of this movie is the more empathy you get, the worse of a lawyer you become. Yeah. And what's the moral calculus of that? Right. Is it better to be a cold-hearted bastard, but you get a good payout for your clients, so you get what your clients want? Or is being a better human and accomplishing less of that the I mean, goal? this movie spins 50 different ways of saying lawyers are terrible people. <laughs> and it's about what should a lawyer be. Right. Um, and the way lawyers tend to be are yes. not the best yeah. things and, to be. But the movie's kind of questioning, like, is that good? Like, is yeah. it better for a lawyer to just be these blunt instruments of law um, with no compassion, no feeling that are just used for a goal? Is that better than just people with empathy and feelings arguing in a courtroom? Or are they a means for healing and change? Yeah, because the second Travolta starts developing emotions and you know has pride and feelings in the case... As a lawyer, he devolves. Yeah. Makes more mistakes. Yes, makes more mistakes. 
is less effective. Yeah. Because he's not willing to do what needs to be done to win. Yeah. In a sense. So, um, yeah, there's all, uh, they they immediately have like a, a summary judgment motion. Yeah, which, over this chapter 11. Yeah. Whatever it's called. It's like, uh, it's basically like, you know, they, they're going to have an emotion hearing um, right before even the trial even starts, yeah. the deposition start, where they're talking about like, and who's the judge? Uh, John Lithgow John from Lithgow Blowout. from Blowout, the serial killer. I just yeah. want to imagine the day on set. Yes. And he's like, Johnny? <laughs> he's like, Johnny? Yeah. <laughs> and they were like, dude, it's good to see you. How long has it been? Fucking uh, 28 yeah. years, man. 18. Right? 18. Yeah, 18, <laughs> 18 years, years, man. They're, just, they're vibing. They're, they're vibing. Out. They're like, oh, man, dude, what a good time yeah. that was on set, dude. Yeah. And then, of course, then Rob, Bobby Duvall comes in. It's like, look at this fucking Joker. It's like, what yeah. do you got against him? It's like, we were in a movie together, too. <laughs> <sighs> fucking Robert Duvall. <laughs> No. Robert Duvall. I like to think that John Lithgow and John yeah. Travolta have stayed in touch. Yeah. I hope so. I hope so, too. But, and it, uh, so there's depositions. Yes. And Mr. Cheese Man Mr. is Cheese. trying to pass this uh, case 11. Client, what's it called? It, it's like a... It, it's a um, I know... Stat, it's like a statute 11 or something statute like that. Statute 11 or something like that. It's and not it, chapter 11 because that's bankruptcy. Right. It's basically like they, they file a motion for the judge to like yeah. immediately um, shut down the case before and it even starts. Mr. Cheeseman does that. I'm going to call him Mr. Cheeseman. Okay. Uh, Mr. Cheeseman. Um, and Robert Duvall knows this is a losing battle and is like, though I am with this side of the courtroom, I am not part of this motion. Yeah. Because he knows Travolta is going to win immediately. Well, because he said, you know, and then John Lithgow's like, um, Mr. Schlickman? Is that what his yeah, name Schlickman. is? Yeah, Schlickman. James Schlickman. He's like, uh, Mr. Schlickman, like, did you know what a, a Statute 11 was? We're coming. He's like, to be honest, Your Honor, I had to look it up. He's like, well, it's interesting you say that because I did too. Yeah. And, I, and this is not it. And it's, and I recognize that this is a cheap, old, ancient ploy that yeah. will not work in my courtroom. And then yes. he strikes down the motion, and then yeah. they are allowed to continue on with the and case. And the courtroom starts, and the process of discovery begins. Yeah. And Travolta knows that to prove this, they're going to have to test, is the water poisoned by this tannery? Right. So they start uh, interviewing employees. And I think early on, they interview James Gandolfini. Yeah, they interview a bunch, and they all just are like, they're all in lockstep of like, oh, I don't know anything. No. Like, they've clearly been threatened in some way. Coached and all that good stuff. James yeah. Gandolfini is the first to say, yeah, I saw dumping. But he won't give up names. Right. Um, but he will say that it happened, which gives, and I'll say like where it's happening. Yeah. So Travolta brings in a geological team. Uh, played by Stephen Fry. Stephen Fry. Looking insane. Oh, jolly good, sir. He has long, like, <laughs> luscious hair. Oh, man. He's bound there. I was like, oh, this is going to be great, ain't it? <laughs> That's Australian, you asshole. <laughs> so, this is going to be great. We're going to dig up a lot of this. We're going to dig up That's the territory. He's like, I'm going to need a big team. That's a good one. I'm going to need a big team. That's a good British one. And See, you can do a good yeah, British. And Travolta's like, uh, how much of a team do you need? He's like, I need a team. <laughs> I bring some, like, an operation he brings in a whole like digging crew yeah. with bulldozers and trucks and shit and the owner of the tanner comes in really like, what are you doing on my property and he's like here's your i have a court, a court order here and a yep. warrant to search the ground and like, ah. um and so yeah they have the testimony from gandolfini they're doing geological digs to find like contamination and i think this is like pretty early on when Travolta starts getting like closer to the case. Yeah. And they're starting to be able to like get into the part part where they start reaching a settlement. So they get together in the conference room and um Travolta is thinking like you know, they're all like, "Okay, so have we reached a settlement?" And he's like, "How much does Grace and Beatrice Foods make like in a year?" Yeah. And they add up the money and like about 646 million dollars or whatever. Um gross. Like, okay, so here's what we want. We want uh, twenty million dollars. Like, okay, we can do that. Yeah. And then I want one point five million for er each of the families. It's like, okay, every year, every year. And, and then he's like, and we want twenty five million for my firm. Yeah, twenty five million for my firm, and it all adds up to like three hundred and ninety yeah. million of something. I think it's three twenty. Yeah, it's million. it's like a number that was going to be turned down. Yeah. And John Travolta knew it, 
and his firm weren't consulted yeah, on that. Because Travolta wants to go to court because he has something to prove. Yeah. And and before that, there was even a monologue where he says, you know, you never want to go to court because yeah. the only reason why you want to go to court is if you want to prove something. Yes. And then cut to that scene and it's where he gives them that Pride number. is his downfall in this right. movie. And Robert Duvall says that. Yes. Later in the film, he's like, because Robert Duvall has like non voiceover narration scenes that might as well be non voiceover yes. narration scenes, which I think would have played off better yeah. as voiceover because it would have been, I mean, Duvall, in my opinion, was he's more of the old, antagonist than yeah. anyone else was. He's just an old hat in this movie and like he has no stake in the matter personally. He just sees it as like it's a game he's playing. Right. Because so, he's always listening to a ball game. Yeah. And he sees his job just the same as he sees that. It's like, it's just a game he plays to win. And so, like, whereas John Travolta gets voiceover narration, Robert Duvall's is he teaches. He teaches, teaches like, law at Harvard or something Mm. like that. And so one of his uh, teaching moments is he's saying, like, you know, pride is a downfall of an attorney. And this gets represented when they're actually at court and he's, like, hounding one of the guys for, like, the dumping. Yeah. And, he, and then cut to, he says, and number one rule in law is never ask a witness why. Yeah. And he asked well, him, like... Bef- there's there's a fair bit that happens right before this. Yeah. I, I'm like, I'm, I yeah. am like skipping through. I want to talk about the witnesses that yeah. they're going to talk to. Because a big... Uh, the uh, They bring in the families for pretrial testimony. Mm-hmm. Where they're talking to all the families. And uh, the reason why that scene with the settlement happens is because... They get a testimony from a dad who starts crying halfway through. And Duvall's like, There's, we cannot let this go to trial. And if we do, we cannot let these people speak. Right. Because if they speak, we're cooked. Well, here's something that's interesting about Robert Duvall's character. That and there is a tiny bit of genuine human connection where he says, we can't let them speak because it'll reopen up trauma. Well, that's kind of his excuse. It, it is. I know. It's yeah. like it starts off that way, but like but you can kind of tell a little bit of Duvall. There's a little bit of Duvall who's like kind of genuine in that. Yeah, a little bit because Robert Duvall's not an evil bad guy. Yeah, he's not an evil. He he's just in it for his interest. He's in it for his interest, and like he, it, it's hard to hate Duvall in this movie, yeah. man. You know, yeah. and because he gets a really good. He like plays that. the lawyer for the bad guys, mm-hmm. and he's kind of lovable yeah, in some got, cases. He is like he's bemused by Travolta in this movie. Yes. Um, but there's all, there's a really great scene after that, and I think after the settlement scene, where they meet with the owner of the tannery again. And they're like, so tell us, you use this... I'm going to look up the name of this chemical. T- TCH. Tri- tri- Trichlochlorothanel. TCE or something Yeah, like TCE. That. And uh, they're like, so did you use this chemical? How do you apply it to your products, to your leather? And the guy just like stares at them. And then he grabs his glass of water and like dumps it on the table. And he's like, "That's how I apply it. I dump. We dump it on the leather." And Travolta is very slick, and he's like, "Ah, so I see. You dump so much like you dumped your water onto my table. And as you can see, some of your water is spilling off my table onto my rug. By this logic, then, when you applied the chemicals to the leather, some of it spilled off your leather into the ground and into the water supply." Yeah. And everyone's like, oh, fuck, this guy's like, more. Yeah, it's like, I'm more interested yeah. in this water that spills off. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's such a good scene. Yeah. Uh, after, There's a lot of good lawyer zinger moments yes. in this movie. There's a lot of good camera motion. Like, in the next scene, it's when Gandolfini kind of decides that he's going to talk fully. Is He's just at home with his family. Eating and dinner. he's watching his wife bring a jug of water around and fill everyone's glasses. Yeah. Because that's what resulted in the kids dying was the water and was contaminated. Gandolfini is a... Pro. an established pro, pro that he, he doesn't have to say anything he doesn't have to he make says it with a look one look one look that's a have you ever heard that harrison ford quote so harrison ford's a big time like edit script editor mm-hmm. when he gets his movies and like he got the script to i think it was L- what lies beneath uh zemeckis movie mm-hmm. and like he at one point he's just going through it and he crossed the whole line and said i could say it with a look it's like, yeah, 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 you fucking can. Show don't tell, man. I just love, I just saw Shang-Chi yesterday, the, the new Marvel movie. Yeah. And uh, it's pretty good. But uh, Tony Lung is in it as uh, Shang-Chi's father, the main villain. 
oh, that guy can do some fucking eye acting. Yeah. Am I talking? There's scenes in that movie where he just like looks and it's a thousand words. Oh, yeah. I love eye acting and Gandolfini's just killing it in the scene. Yeah. Just everything is being communicated. No dialogue, just his eyes watching the thing and then the, the change he's doing with just his micro like expressions. Yeah. It's, oh. it's a great scene. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And so because of that, he goes to Ann Anderson and apologizes for being a part of this, even if he wasn't really like a part of it. Yeah. Um, and then she gets her apology in that moment, which is all that she wanted from the beginning. Yeah. Ooh, he's going to revise call sheet. Oh, shit. Uh, I'll check it in a little bit. <laughs> but, um, oh, my call got pushed up. and 6.30 now. <laughs> mm, lovely. Um, but after that, I, I wrote in my notebook, okay, this is great, question mark. Because uh, I was really into the movie at this point. Yeah. Um, Travolta, this is when he messes up, and you were starting to say earlier. Yeah, so they get, gets they get into the court case. Yeah. And Travolta is talking to the landowner for the Tanner refinery. Yes. And this is when, intercutting back and forth, um, Robert Duvall's class, and he's saying the things not to do as an attorney. Yeah. One of the things he says is never ask a witness why. Yes. And Trolls ask why. And he asks him, why I, doesn't this, like, why are you not upset yeah. that, you know, there was dumping without you knowing about it? And then he and goes into this whole thing about my, my family fam- owned, owned this, this land, land for, for generations. generations. And he's like, ah, he's not answering the question. And John yeah. looks like, well, you got to let him answer the question. And he's like, ah, it's not the question I'm asking. And he's yeah. like, and you could tell Travolta's like panicked. Yeah. He knows like, oh, fuck, I fucked up. Yeah. And he's like, ah, he's not answering the question. He's like, let him answer the question. And then he answers the question and it like resonates with the jury. Because yeah. he's like, I yeah. don't have this land in my generation. You don't think I, I'm upset about this? I want to celebrate some camera movement in the scene at the very beginning of the scene. Mm-hmm. Um, because he tells Ann Anderson to sit in the back left corner, or he tells her to sit in the courtroom, and she says she's going to sit in the back left corner because whenever she lost and her, her kid son in the grocery their store, their agreement was that anywhere they went, if they got lost, they would go to the back left corner. And, and the last thing he said to her was that, I'll see, I'll see you, you in the back, the back left, left corner, corner of heaven. heaven. I was like, oh my God. I, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I kind of rolled my eyes on that <laughs> a little. Line. Well, it's a, I was just it's like, a oh, little, it's uh, okay. it's a little bit too much, uh, too much Parmesan. Going yeah, on, going on, going on the chicken. Um, too much fucking Parmesan. <laughs> it's a little. Too, uh, That's exactly right, yeah. though. It's a little too much fucking Parmesan. Um, but um, at the beginning of this scene, it's like a pullback from the courtroom, and then the door shut uh, in the shot. And then it goes inside the courtroom and it just tracks through and you're seeing her in the back left corner without even, it's not even focus of the shot. It's just like establishing all the players and where they are on the board in this scene. Yeah. Because if we're going with like Robert Duvall seeing this as a game, we kind of see it as like a chess board. And we'll wow. see, and the camera kind of moves through showing us where all the players are on the board. Well, Gandolfini calls Mr. Cheese Man, Mr. Chess Man. Yes. Like there's a lot of definite, like, again, this goes to one of my, problems with the film which is like nothing's really give open for interpretation so much yeah. as it's told to you yeah the chess piece metaphor is very apparent in this movie yeah it's very apparent like william h macy is like the queen or whatever <laughs> this chess piece yes. and john travolt is the king in this side um same goes for well, robert duvall well so. after travolta messes up at this then we get a lot of prime William H. Macy content. Oh, yeah. Because the law firm runs out of money. Yeah, the law firm's spending so much money on, like, yeah. the geological digs and the doctors and the teams, and, like, they're having no yeah. money coming because they're only working on this case. And so... We get this, like, five-minute montage of William H. Macy, like, taking out every single credit card possible. He, um, like, mortgages his own house. He mortgages everyone's house, and he fires all the staff. He lays so. off all the staff, and... There's um, a really funny scene where they're all meeting about the case, and just in the background, get, like, crews are carrying, like, rugs and furniture out of the office. That, that's, like, a bit, like, throughout the yeah. whole, like, uh, yeah. the, throughout the movie where, like, they're meeting, and there's, like, less and less things <laughs> yes. in the office. It's and very I, good. I do, I did like that a lot. Uh, there was, um, like, a, a line where Travolta's like, I'm, I'm not the financial advisor for this, and yeah. then it goes into the montage of William H. Macy doing and he, his... And he's like, fire all the cleaning staff we can empty our own ashtrays and he empties his ashtray like onto the floor yeah (laughs) um and then like he's on the phone with the creditor he's vacuuming because they fired all the staff like he's it's a really funny like sequence yeah so uh yeah i I said robert duvall um john the judge so um 
it's at this point that they call Travolta in to the judge's chambers, John yes. Lithgow, and the defense attorneys are already there. Yeah. He's like, did you guys discuss anything without me? He's like, no, like they just, just got here coffee. early. And um, he gets there. He's like, so I'm going to put this to a decision for the jury yeah. before we even go on to the witness testimony with the victims or the, yeah. or the families because I'd rather know now if, if you – if the jury doesn't believe you when you make the case that yeah. they poison the water, then there is no case. So we're gonna we're just gonna ask that question now yeah. to decide if the jury believes that portion of it. Because mm-hmm. if they do, then you can bring the families in and talk to yeah. them. But if they don't believe that, you have no case and we don't need to call the families in. It's actually something that I kind of agreed with. Mm-hmm. Like if I was thinking as a defense attorney, yeah. it's an easy sell yes. to a judge. It's like if they don't believe this portion, we don't need these families to relive all this trauma. If it's all, because as a defense attorney, all I'm going to say is, that's awful. I'm sorry you had to go through that. Yeah. But there's no proof or evidence that the water was even what made your child sick. Because you can't even prove the water was poisoned. Yeah. Much less by us. So it is kind of like yeah. genius in some sense. It's a genius move by Duvall's character. Yeah. And so they give the, the jury... The questions and the questions are worded in the first like one was law like, school. The first one's like, "Do you think that the water was poisoned by this company?" And the next one's like, "Do you believe this amount of ditrechlamine or whatever?" Well, it's like, like by the prerogative of this evidence delivered by this attorney, do you believe that said company uh, defendants uh, Beatrice yeah. Food? And it's like this long-winded yeah. like essay question. Yeah. Um, and they does that, and then Travolta is like making the case, like, "No, the juries are going to fucking yeah. understand this bit." Yeah. So they give them all those questions, and the jury goes into a quarters. Yeah, and the lawyers decide. are all hanging out outside. And we have a great scene. Oh, great with Duval scene. Duval and Travolta. It's a like great Cheeseman, fucking... Duval, Travolta are like sitting on three benches. Yeah. And Duval just comes over to Travolta. And he's like, "You're really good at." And like, yeah. I don't normally wait on juries. Yeah. He's like, "I do." Yeah. And Robert's like, "I know you're good at it." Yeah. And he comes over, and they start talking about. It's like you know. And he pulls out a twenty dollar bill. Yeah. He's like, "I'll make you a bet right now." And he's like, "If that's a settlement, you're gonna need something a lot bigger yeah. than that." And he's like, "What if we add six zeros to it?" Well, he he first says, "What I really love, it's like, well, according to our IRS and all the uh, the debts that you have, yeah, because and that's when he reveals because well, something that Tra- the Travolta and their firm have been playing off is that yeah. they can do the long haul. This was something that was established earlier in the yeah. movie." Was that while all the excavation crews were around, yeah. you just saw had Duval and Travolta's character. Yeah. Duval's like, you know, this all looks awfully very expensive, and yeah. you guys aren't a boutique firm. Like mm-hmm. he's like catching on to this thing, and Travolta then says, like some point later, it's like as long as they think we can afford to do this, like we we're can, fine. Yeah. Uh, but the moment they know we can't afford to do so, we're fucked. Yes. And this is like the little moment where yeah, Duval so shows his hand. He, yeah. He's like, you know, in the IRS like tax reports show and, like. And Duval has confidence that he's gonna. He's like, oh, he yeah. calls exactly what happens. Yeah. He says, "I'm gonna get off. Cheeseman's not." And he says, and "So he says, why don't I put? Why don't I put six zeros on this?" And he says, "You're gonna settle knowing you're gonna win or whatever." Yeah. And Duval's just like, "Let's just do it." Travolta takes the twenty and rips it in half and throws it out. With Robert Duval yes. sitting on the bench, and what happens next? Exactly what Duval exactly says. Duval says. Duval gets off. He leaves the courtroom. It's like Mr. Fosher or whatever yep, his Fosher. character name is. Like Mr. Fosher, you are dismissed. Yep. And he closes his book. He leaves his glass of water on the yeah. table and he gets up and he walks yeah. out. That's so good. So fucking good. And <laughs> because of that, Travolta's it's more pride. It's more of like he wants justice now at this point for these people. Yeah. That blinded him from what would have gotten him the best deal which sends him further spiraling yeah because he would have had 20 million if he'd made that deal right then yeah as it stands the re- like the next 10 minutes are just kind of business i don't think there's really much to talk about he meets with Sidney pollock and well like i wrote down like the firm is out of money yes out out of money he meets with Sidney pollock who's like the head of grace and mr cheeseman's boss to yeah. um make an agreement there's I a lot love, of talk about sailboats. <laughs> well, I love this bit because, like, this is where they do kind of open it up for interpretation. They don't yeah. exactly say it. And that is when John Travolta meets, like, the head vice president of Grace yeah. or whatever, he's, like, playing these control mind games with yeah. them. Because he first gets into this Harvard he, room. Yeah. And Travolta immediately, is, like, pulls out, well, I have this thing. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. He's like, you didn't go to Harvard? He's like, you went to Cornell. Oh, Cornell's a great school. Yeah. Damn great school. 
and he starts talking about business like oh no no no, this is a harvard club yeah. like we don't conduct business yeah. here it goes I'm sorry, off of don't know. what i said at the beginning where it's like this movie's about a low status person trying to be high status and this whole sequence is just travolta being pushed back down into yeah. his status forcing him to accept the settlement they give him and so then there's the scene when they finally go to his office and he this intercuts with yeah. him describing to his law firm the experience he's like and then he talks two three hours about sailboats and all this stuff yeah. and i'm just like he's like there's then, a lot of talk about me putting my feet on the desk yes and he's <laughs> yeah. like put your feet on the desk put your feet on, oh no it's fine put yeah. your feet on the and he finally puts his feet on the desk and he's like you're not going to get the yeah. law settlement that you yeah. want. And then he gives him like the $8 million settlement, yeah. which the firm wanted him to take. He said, if you take any settlement, $8 million. Yeah. That'll pay off our debts. That'll give something to the yeah. families. So he offers him $8 million. And the firm's like, what? Yeah. And then Travolta says no. Travolta says no. But then very shortly enough. after, he takes it. Yeah, shortly after he takes it. Because he's out of money. He can't win in the yeah. trial. And he goes to the families and they say, you're each going to get like $360,000 yeah. or something like that. And they're like, we don't want money. It's like, we just want it cleaned up. And he's like, that's not He's happen. like, we wanted an apology. Does this look like an apology? Like yeah. he, she said, like. You said money it, was an apology. Money was an apology. Like a, enough money means an apology. Yeah. Does Is this it, seem like enough for an apology? No. Right. Because even as he said at the beginning, like. A child is the wor- is worth the least. Yeah. And we're seeing that in action at this point. Right. And we're seeing e- everything that Travolta stood for at the beginning is now being turned against him. Right. And he is now the mid-40s white male cut short on his prime. Right. Forced to accept an $8 million assignment when he could have taken the 20 from uh, Duval. Yeah. So... They take the deal. They take the deal, and then there's a conversation um, with between him and his firm, and they all dump. Him. <laughs> they all dump him. They Shalub, like, um, William H Macy, and the third guy uh, go off and start their own firm. Yeah, and Travolta's forced into a, being his own like um, a small time law practice. Um, a very defeated man forced back into pure low status. Yeah, so he. Like he's not living in a great apartment. Yeah. He's like his law firm is he like a very fucking closet. Hilariously has like a betta fish, but in a, a blender. <laughs> Did you see that? No. Like behind him when he's in his apartment, there's like a betta fish in a blender. Like the blender is filled with water, and there's just a betta fish in there. It's I, very strange. <laughs> I, I don't know why they would choose that. I missed that. Like it's not hard. It, a a fishbowl is not expensive. It's much cheaper than a fucking blender. I wonder what that means. I <laughs> have no idea what's going on there. Yeah. Um, he, while he's at home, he's remembering about when he was at the diner, there was like yeah. a water spill. Yeah. And it goes back to his earlier deposition of yeah. the owner of the land about the silicone yeah. dumping thing. And then he's given like an idea. It's like, oh, maybe I didn't get any witnesses who saw the dumping. Yeah. But I have a witness who did the dumping. Yes. Something to that effect, I'm pretty sure. Right. So he goes back and he researches again. And he find he thinks he finds a guy who rented because earlier in the movie it, like he discovered someone who rented a bunch of dump trucks on a certain day, um, but he never like questions them for some reason. So he goes to the guy's house and he gets him to confess that he was the one who took all of the dump. He cleaned up the mess to hide the spill from. And they dumped it in the river. Yes. And there's a great scene where, like he said, and you knew it was bad because there were kids that were lighting these firecrackers yes. off, throwing them across the river. Yeah. One of them gets in the river and sets it ablaze. Yes. The f- and that's how they knew it was toxic. And that's how they knew. Yeah. Um, and so Travolta has all the evidence he needs, but he does not have the status at this point. So he writes this letter. So he finally, after an hour and 40 some minutes of learning his lesson, he cuts his pride. And sends the case to another attorney. He sends it to the Environmental Protection Agency. Or as the Simpsons movie would say, Epa, Epa, Epa. Thank you. He sends it to Epa. Thank you. Um, and they take it. And Duval gets uh, the deposition in the mail. And he realizes like he's been outplayed. Travolta finally learned the lesson, undercut his pride, and did the right, did the thing that he needed to do. Right. But well, someone else is going to get the, the status for this, but there will be justice yeah. done. 
Uh, we don't really get a conclusion to that sentiment outside of text. Yeah. Because they give like, t- there's not like, like the a classic biopic. Yeah. yeah. It's like the family's all got like certain millions of dollars from yeah. Beatrice Foods. It was and all cleaned after up. that. It was all cleaned up. Like they all, they all cleaned up the Jane whole Slickman stuff. Jane Slickman was no longer set like most eligible bachelor, but he now runs a private practice. Yeah. And then there's a final scene. Yeah. Where he. With John Travolta's in collections court. Yes. Because he's in so much debt. Yes. And who's the judge, Jeff? Kathy Bates. Kathy Bates. <laughs> Back from primary colors. What the fuck? I don't know why she's here. I guess they were just what? friends. I just, like, she has like maybe three lines of dialogue. Yeah. And of course she plays it off wonderfully. Yes. Because she's like the heartfelt judge who like yeah. kind of cares. She's like, you were like this successful attorney. Yeah, like what happened? All... What happened to you? And I don't know what. Travolta doesn't say anything. He says he has like fourteen dollars in his bank account. He has, he has fourteen dollars in his bank account, and Travolta just kind of like sits he kinda there like, and he's, stares. He's happy with himself. Yeah, yeah. He's he just kind of sits there. Yes, and then cut to black. He was cut down in his prime, but he's realized that this is his prime. He's realizing that he doesn't have to be high status. He can be happy being this low status person doing the right thing for the right reasons. And all of that is not nonverbal. Yes, because he doesn't reply. Yes. To Kathy Bates asking what happened. It just and he just sits there in the courtroom looking like he did yeah. the right thing. And then speaking of a little too much Parmesan, uh, it then cuts to credits and uh Talking Heads Take Me to the River starts playing. It's like Take Me to the River. And I'm like, Okay, dude, well, I don't think we need this right now. <laughs> okay, guys. I'm like, You had a good ending. I don't think we need Take Me to the River. Yeah. Cause the, yeah. But but that's the uh, that's the movie. That's the movie. That's uh, you know I will admit talking about this with you I, has worn me up a little bit to it. It's I'm good... also not gonna lie. I started watching this last night. Yeah, because I watched thin, a Thin Red Line yesterday, and then I got halfway through Civil Action. Yeah, and then I went to the bars with some friends, so I paused yeah. in the middle and watched the rest of it today. Mm-hmm. So that might have affected yeah. my viewing experience a little bit that I did not watch mm-hmm. it in one complete sitting. But now talking to you through it and, you know, get kind of connecting everything together, yeah. I will say like, yeah. Like, I think a very strong little movie. It, it is a nice connective piece. Yes. It's all within its own realm and structure. It doesn't, doesn't have to have a sequel. Well, it doesn't have to be a miniseries. So. Stuart, before we talk about the impact of this movie, we got to do something. Okay. What did the hair, what was the hair like? Oh, fuck. Forgot about the hair ranking. Uh, all right. Cue the hair ranking music. All right, welcome to the hair ranking. Uh, this is my name is Stuart Elmore. I'm Jeff Sweeney. Um, it's the same hair we've had in every movie recently. <laughs> yeah. Um, open up the hair ranking. <sighs> Put it below Welcome to Hollywood Above Basements. Ooh, below Welcome to Hollywood Above Basements, the dumb waiter. All right. Uh, That's it. Yeah. Th- there's That's r- it. Like, what are, we, we've said everything we can about this hair, right? Yeah. It's it's not even... I can't even say, like, you know... I'm, I, need to go, I need to go on a rant. Because too many times have we covered the same fucking <laughs> hair, and the hair ranking has been, like, 30 seconds long. But let me go on a little tangent here to stretch this a little bit for you, folks. We work on movie sets, and we know there's a lot of people involved in involved in, in this. hair. In hair, like there's like the the head of the hair department, the key hairdresser, and then hairdressers that from that they get their own fucking trailer. They're in the pre production process. They don't just show up and start working on the hair. No, they have like planning to do. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, with all this like John Travolta hair nonsense, where it's all the same, I just always wonder. It's like, what was that conversation like? About the hair. About the hair. You know, there's got to be one. There's at least got to be one. Nowadays, we would call it one Zoom call. Back then, it'd probably be a joint phone call or whatever it was. Or maybe if it's all taking place in LA, the pre-production, it's like one office meeting with a hairdresser. Mm -hmm. And it may last 15 minutes, right? And they ask like, okay, um, so uh, Miss uh, Miss Dean, who's the head of the hair department. um, So, yeah, I mean, you got all our materials. You got the director's uh, materials for... You know, the character and what they represent and their change. Do you have any ideas? And you're like, no, I'm just going to go with like a regular approach. Yeah. Like, I'll just do this to his hair. Here's my semi references. I mean, this is, this is like the test. point in Trolta's career where he has 
hairstylist for Mr. Travolta in of the end course. credits. It's the same person, and they follow him everywhere. And they do the same thing. And they do the same thing. And it's like, um, <laughs> like do something Stuart, different. I will tell you, this is all just, you know, the calm before the storm before we have to talk about the battlefield earth hair. And I get that, but you had to do something different for that movie. What I'm getting We're going to have a two hour long hair ranking on that movie. We are. What I'm getting at is, though, the just where it doesn't call for different hair. Yeah. But take ownership over your department. Like you. And even if he has his own personal stylist who gets autonomy over what they decide what John Trollwood's hair look like, fine. Mm-hmm. Okay. Then it's Miss Dean, the head of hair, and it's, what was the name of his fucking hairdresser? I don't know. Uh, uh, Mitch Stanton or whatever. So it's like Angela Dean and, and Mitch Stanton, who's the personal hairstylist, they go into this meeting with the director and the maybe the producer or whatever, and they're like, what are you going to do about Judge Wilde's hair? Mm-hmm. And they don't even discuss an idea. They don't even go with anything about it. Like, he's a lawyer. And yeah. he's a lawyer who, like you said, is low status who pretends to be high status. I'm and he sure have really jelly hair. Oh, I'm sure you could have done something. Get shorty. Mm-hmm. Like get shorty. He didn't need that kind of hair. But he had it. But he had it. And it meant something. Mm-hmm. Pulp fiction. Did he need that kind of hair? Yeah. Yeah, he did. Okay, so that's not a great example. <laughs> that's not a great example. What what's an example like this broken arrow? All these movies. Broken Arrow. Like, I'm no, well, Broken Arrow, like, I'm talking about, like, a movie like Get Shorty where it could have passed as having regular yeah. hair, Broken Arrow hair. Yeah. But they did something different. Yeah. What's another example of that? Where, like, it didn't need to be slightly different, but it was because it was in service of the character. Uh, uh, phenomenon, maybe? Yeah. Maybe it was, you know, disheveled and they got a haircut scene in. Like, that's something. Yeah. Right? Stewart's getting really frustrated with the hair. I'm right just now. saying, like he, really, he, commi- he committed this 33 episodes ago and is now like really in the weeds. With I it. just like I respect artists of all levels and craft yes. on this, like the set dressers, the lighting crew, the camera folks, the hairdressers, the makeup artists, the special effects makeup artists, the VFX people. Like everybody has an art and craft that they contribute to a work in peace, and it's like to be just fucking lazy and say meh. Yes. Uh, we'll just do something regular for us here. Mm. That's okay. Uh, come on. Yeah. Like, make a decision. Make a choice. <laughs> make a choice. Mm-hmm. And that's all I have to say about this continuous, hair. regular ass this hair disgusting. that we keep getting of John Travolta. We, there, we get some good ones coming up, I promise you. We do. But I. it's just like, you know, too many of these episodes have we gone through the hair ranking and we've all said the same thing. It's regular John Travolta yes. hair. In the last 30 seconds, we have nothing to add or contribute. Stamp done. And I just need the audience to know that, like, I don't like doing that. Yeah. I want it to be something better. I want it to be something more involved. I want it to be a choice. Mm-hmm. And there's not being that many choices being made. Cue the outro <sighs> music. Cue the hair ranking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So All this right. movie comes out. Uh, Christmas of uh, 1998. Uh, Awful weekend for it to come out. It is in competition with Shakespeare in Love, The Prince of Egypt, Star Trek Insurrection, You've Got Mail, Stepmom, and Patch Adams. Fuck. It does not make uh, a lot of money. It makes $56 million on a 75 budget. That's not... It's bad. (laughs) It's bad. I mean, well, we've seen worse flops of Travolta. What was she so lovely? Wasn't uh, she so lovely? She's like, so I, lovely. It was like seven million on a twelve budget or something like that. And that was pretty bad. But I, I mean, this I is we've covered a this really loses like, bad flop. Yeah, this, right? mo- this loses like twenty million. What was Mad? Wasn't Mad City a humongous flop? Yes. What was that flop? It was like ten to fifty or something like it that. It was like yeah. yeah. So I mean, this is a flop. It's a <laughs> yeah. twenty million. Fucking this is flop. a big flop. Um, mostly just because of its placement. This should not have come out on Christmas <laughs> against all those movies. It's not even a fucking Christmas movie. Yeah. Like, what the fuck, I mean, it, it does have a Christmas sequence in it uh, where William H. Macy is listening to the little drummer boy while he's trying to get money because uh, like, they're gifting him okay, money. Yeah. But, um, right. yeah, it's it's like I said at the beginning, it's the height of Travolta but also the, the cliff where like you're seeing him fly too close to the sun he can't compete with like a Tom Hanks and you've got mail or something like that. Wait a minute. Is this our last movie in this era that we're going to cover in the 
A-list era? No. No. Okay. The A-list era goes in our estimate. Taking to, until a Pelham one, two, three, right? It goes until 2008. Where he's still like, oh. where he is still like an A list actor. He gets dinged and he stops making like good movies shortly after this, or I shouldn't say good, but great movies. We get them few and far between after this, but he's still an A list star until the late two thousands. So we're not quite re-entering an eighties period yet. No, we're gonna enter a very dodgy period of movies, but he's still a big star. Like he's in movies with big budgets still. And you think this is like the cliff side? I think this is the peak. Um, we see, and then, you know, obviously once you get to a peak, it's like a downward. So we're at that point, we're starting to head downward. Um, we're going to get the cliff in, a, in like two weeks. Um, There's still one glimmer of hope after this. Yes. A little animated film. Yes, which we're going to cover very soon. We're going to cover very soon. This movie gets pretty good reviews. Roger Ebert loves this movie. He gives it three and a half out of four and says civil action is like John Grisham for grownups. Whoa. He loves this movie. Um, Interesting take. But yes, that's that's the civil action. That's the civil action. Do you action. have any last minute thoughts? Um, I think especially talking to you about it, it's definitely changed my mood about it. Yeah. Um, I'm very fond of this movie. I, I, again, probably not something I'd... This would be one where I am, if I had cable, yes. which I don't. It's a great cable movie. It's a great cable that, movie. That's what I miss, the this, cable movie. This is like you're 13. Yeah. Uh, you're, you got a pizza on the dining room kitchen table right next to you, and you got a two-liter Mountain Dew on the nightstand, yeah. and you're in your dad's recliner. Your parents have just gone to bed because it's 946. And you're looking through some movies gets to like 958 and you're like what's there to watch you get to the guide menu the guide window on your tv right because you got an old comcast remote Mm -hmm. and you're scrolling through scrolling through scrolling through and then you get to channel 59 tnt it's 958 what and what movie is action what movie is ending um what's that uh dragon movie with matthew mcconaughey christian bale <laughs> rain of fire rain of fire is just ending and yeah. what's coming up next a civil a action, civil action. <laughs> and you say all I right guess i'm sticking with this you're sticking with that and you watch it yeah that's what this movie yes. is for me hell yeah i would agree with that would i search for it on netflix no would you watch it if it was present yes yeah um yeah yeah that's, so, that's where my final thoughts yeah we still have to record one more episode. Uh, so I'm going to wrap this up. Well, I mean, the audience doesn't know we've been recording for a few hours. Yeah. <laughs> like, to the audience, we do we, we record these in chunks. Yes. And this weekend, we decided to dedicate a big chunk. Yeah, we're doing three movies We're this doing weekend. three movies this week. So, you, not that you guys know any better, because yeah. they're still coming out You're just out getting them weeks, sequentially. Apart. Yeah. But we are, we've been, we're deep into it. It's like 8 p.m. <laughs> it's, it's dark outside. Um, we still got one more movie to talk about. Fucking A. Yeah. Uh, thank you all for listening to this episode yeah. on Civil Action. Make sure to tune next week for our episode on Our Friend Martin. Our Friend Martin. The 1999 Nine? animated uh, TV classic um, that probably 80% of people have watched. Uh, in when, middle, in if you fourth were, grade. In fourth grade, if you, ha- if you went to middle school between 2000 and 2010, you probably watched this movie. Yeah. The librarian probably hauled out the TV <laughs> on the moving yeah, car. the big the fucking yeah. box TV. Which we're going to, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, in t- 10 minutes when we, we'll talk about that movie. Uh, please make sure to rate, review, subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. As a reminder, we are available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. We're getting some traction on the Google Podcasts unexpectedly. Thank you to all the folks who've been listening on that. All 69 of you from last month. Um, <laughs> uh, find us at Travolting Pod on Twitter or Instagram for updates and fun stuff. Pop into our Reddit, r slash Travolting. Email any comments or questions to TravoltingPodcast at gmail.com. Find me on Twitter at Jeff W. Sweeney. Find me on Instagram at Stuart Elmo 95. And special thanks to Rebecca Johnson for our graphic design and Michael Van Bodegum Smith for our theme music. Have a great week, everyone. See you for our friend Martin. Hey, Jeff. Yeah. Did someone just walk in with White Castle? Oh. Wait. What the?